All right, sounds like we're live. Everybody can hear me? Great. I did want to start out class. Uh, we'll start with a word of prayer, and then I want to start uh, make a few comments during the class time instead of using the worship time and the Lord, Lord's Supper time to make some of those comments about uh, being glad to be here and all that. So let's go ahead and bow with a word of prayer. God, you are so amazing and so powerful and so strong and yet so gentle and kind and loving towards us who are weak so many times. We're thankful for your mercy and your kindness and your patience. We're thankful that you seek us, you look for us until you find us, and then you rejoice when you have found us. And we thank you, Lord, for the chance that we have to open up your word today and to study from it. We pray that you'll open our hearts, help us have good, honest hearts as we look into your word. And help us to draw out from your word what you would have us to learn so that we can be better Christians and we can encourage one another and edify one another even more. We love you and we thank you for all the good things you do for us. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so it's good to be here. I thought I'd take time just a little bit in the Bible class just to say thank you for allowing us to come uh, and be with you today with the prospects of looking for a future relationship. Uh, enjoyed the week so far, the weekend so far. Had a lot of conversations with Herb, a lot of conversations with uh, at least a couple of meetings with the elders a few weeks ago or a month or so ago. I've enjoyed all those, and those all have been beneficial and helpful. So I'm glad that they've invited us to share this weekend with you. Uh, so many of you have made comments about how jam-packed the couple days have been and asked about our, how we're doing, and I appreciate your concern about that. Uh, but I, I was, for some of you who don't know, I did work as a district manager for Aldi for a while. And so how fast their employees work and, uh, in the store, their very high-paced work environment. And I know a lot of you work long, hard hours on a regular basis. So when I feel guilty when you're asking me how I'm doing, when all I had to do yesterday was sit on Herb's back porch, Herb and Trisha's back porch, and meet you. I mean, who, people who love God and people who want to serve God. And I, he I heard so many great stories yesterday of how you came to know the Lord. And I was just better, I was, I'm better off for knowing those stories and knowing you. And I thought it was interesting, those of you who participated, some of you were learning things about one another as well as you were talking and telling stories about one another. So I thought that was pretty neat as I would hear one of you say, oh, I didn't know that about somebody else there. So it was just a good time. And so it was, it was a, a, you know, had a long day to it yesterday, but that really can't be considered work, getting to have a chance to meet you guys and talk to you guys and get to know you guys a lot better. So I really enjoyed that. After a, a couple of the sessions were over, we didn't know what was going to happen, you know, uh, who, what kind of questions we were going to be asked. It's a little scary situation when the floor is wide open, you know, to ask whatever you want. And so uh, you guys were kind and generous and, and really open with us, and I really appreciated that. And after, I think, the second session, when it was time for lunch, Shelly was like, I really enjoyed that. That's, that, that was good. So uh, we might just start porch meetings at the hind uh, just whenever we want to. I mean, you're just you know, hey, let's go, let's go to the porch and talk for a while. And I'm sure I'm sure they won't mind. All right, you may not get the coffee and the hot chocolate and all that good stuff. But and so the way this all came down, just to let you know, is as far as I was supposed to. You know this. A couple weeks ago, it was announced I was supposed to do the, the talk for the Lord's Supper, and I was supposed to preach, and then I got a call. Sunday evening, I believe, uh, two weeks ago, and Herb was telling me all this stuff, and then he gave me that nervous laugh. <laughs> and I was like, what is it, Herb? <laughs> what is it? And I know this is short notice, and you can say no if you want to, but some of the people are wondering, would you teach the Bible class too? And so I said, sure, I'll, I'll teach the Bible class. And then uh, gave me the information, and then Brian tried to help me out a little bit. He called me like the next week and said, look, teaching a Bible class that you haven't been in and pick it up in the middle of it, 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 15, we, we can make some concessions and you can teach 13, I'll just teach 12, you can teach 13, or you can just teach whatever you want. And I thought, you know what, I want to at least show the church and the elders that I'm willing to, to go with this and do this and this alignment that some of you th think, uh, you know, some of you really enjoy and it's been edifying for you. I'm willing to go with that and try it and see how it works for me. And you, you at least will know that uh, it's, I, my, my attitude and my effort is going to be what, it, what is best for this congregation. So if the congregation likes the alignment and wants that, it's not something that I would hesitate be, being part of. And so 
With all that being said, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we're in a section of the scripture that Paul is dealing with spiritual gifts. Brian has dealt with 12 and 13 on Wednesday night. If you go back to 11, there's a lot of talk from 11 through 14 about what takes place in the assembly. The Corinthians had been doing a lot of things wrong, and Paul had been rebuking them throughout the entire letter for the things that they had been doing that were not following after what God wanted. Part of it was not loving the way that they should. They weren't treating one another properly. They were suing one another. They were letting uh, sexual immorality being practiced, and they were being puffed up about that. There was just chapter after chapter after chapter. There's something that they were doing that was not according to the way that they should be acting as Christians. Right, And it's been pointed out, I've watched a couple of the lessons in 1 Corinthians on, online, that love is the key. And so in chapter 13, he's talking about how important love is. And if I'm able to have all the spiritual gifts in the world, and yet I don't have love, it, it really doesn't profit anything. And so you get to chapter 14, in verse 1, he says, Pursue love and desire spiritually, spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. So what he's going to be doing in chapter 14, the Corinthians had this view that speaking in tongues was the best of all the spiritual gifts. And they wanted to sh sort of show off and put themselves in the limelight by speaking in spiritual gifts and have arrows pointing at them. Here I am. I have a spiritual gift. I'm speaking in another language. I'm speaking in a tongue. And so Paul is dealing with this and he's going to show them the tongue speaking isn't the most important spiritual gift because it doesn't produce the result we're after in the assembly. The, 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 the spiritual gift that produces the result that we're after in the assembly is prophesying. And the result that we're after in the assembly is edification of the saints. And so he's going to use all uh, uh, this chapter 14 to show how important edification is and how important it is that we use spiritual gifts in a way that accomplishes the purpose that God wants them to accomplish. So what a tongue is in the Bible, a tongue is being able to speak in another language. And, and most of the time, we, we don't have a lot about tongues in the Bible, to be honest with you. There's just a couple texts. And so a lot of talk religiously goes on about speaking in tongues, and it's probably disproportionate to how much information we have in the Scripture about speaking in tongues. So you have a couple of references to it in the Gospels. You have at the end of Book of Mark, it's a sign that's going to follow and confirm the Word. But I want to just, a tongue basically in the Bible is a language, a known human language, that somebody was given the ability to speak without having studied that language. And the, the Acts 2 passage really details that out, that that's what a, the tongues were. And so in this passage, because we're going to have talked about in this passage, tongues that only the person speaking them could understand and God could understand, and figuring out what those are. From the text, those, I think what they were speaking there were, was not some angelic language. I still think it was a foreign language, just nobody in the audience knew that particular foreign language. And so they would be speaking as they were to God. So a tongue in the Bible is a language that people know. It's a, it's a language that people would know. In, in, in verse 11, he makes that point. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. So tongues... Foreign languages that people understand uh, that, that were there for a reason to communicate the gospel, the gospel message. And what prophecy is, prophecy is either foretelling something that's going to happen in the future, but that's not always what it is. It's just speaking messages from God, foretelling, foretelling or foretelling. So he's having these two spiritual gifts that he's sort of uh, talking to them about because they were putting so much emphasis on speaking in tongues. And he's saying, you got it all wrong in the assembly. The tongues don't do what we want it to accomplish. And there's a lot that we can learn from that as well. Uh, the pursuing love, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1. What does he say there? Knowledge does what? Puffs up. What does love do? Love edifies. So in chapter 13, he talks about love. In 13 and verse 13, now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And then he starts out chapter 14, pursue love. And that's just a short statement that would solve a lot of problems, that we all just pursued love. And I know you guys talk about that a lot, and I think that's a great thing to talk about. But before we get into more of the text, let's just look at the, the, the purpose of these spiritual gifts. Why did God give spiritual gifts in the first century? Okay? So, yes, sir? To confirm the words that they were speaking. 
Yeah, a lot of it was to confirm the words. And even go back to the Old Testament, you can find that. Remember in the example of Moses, God's telling Moses the burning bush, and Moses is giving excuse after excuse after excuse why he doesn't want to go and deliver God's people. And then uh, he says, who am I going to tell sent me? How are they going to believe that you actually sent me? And so what does God give him to show that God sent Moses to deliver the people? What were the signs that he gave them? The rod. The rod, turning into a snake. The hand, and then he says, if they don't believe these two, then he gave them another one, which was the blood, the water turning into blood. So in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 8, it says, then it will be, if they do not believe you nor heed your message of the first sign, that they may believe the message of the latter sign, and it shall be, if they do not believe even those two signs or listen to your voice, that you shall take water from the river and pour it on dry land. The water which is taken from the river will become blood on the dry land. So those were given to Moses to prove that Moses was speaking for God. And so when they saw that, they know, hey, that, guy, that, that Moses is from God because he can do these things that, that no one else can, can, can do. When, when God is turning leadership over to Joshua in Joshua chapter 3 and verse 7, God is going to perform a sign in the presence of all the people to let them know that Joshua is their leader and that he's going to be with Joshua like he's with everybody else. In other words, now it's time to listen to Joshua. You had been listening to Moses all these years because you knew I was with Moses. Now it's time to listen to Joshua. Joshua 3 and verse 7, it says, And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of Israel, that they may know that, that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. You shall command the priest, bear the Ark of the Covenant, and the, the Jordan River was going to stop flowing. That was the sign God gave. Listen to what Joshua says, okay? So you know, you can listen to Joshua. I'm giving him this evidence to show that. Uh, the apostles there in the Mark 16, 16 passage where I always alluded to, confirming the word, these signs would follow them. In Acts chapter 10 and chapter 11, there was a case where the Gentiles were allowed to speak in tongues. And what was the purpose of allowing Cornelius and the Gentiles to speak in tongues? That they're accepted of God. That they're accepted of God, right? And, and that's what the, the point that Peter makes. He, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as it did on us at the beginning. And so the Acts, the Acts chapter 10 and the Acts chapter 2 are unique experiences of the Holy Spirit coming down and uh, giving these miraculous signs like this to show that I accept Gentiles now. So there'd be no mistake about it. They were able to, to speak in tongues like that. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we find out that these gifts were given for the profit of all. So did God give somebody a spiritual gift so that they could be elevated above other people? No. <laughs> Definitely not. Did God give people spiritual gifts so they could use them for their own good? And their own, uh, can you think of a, an example in the Bible of somebody who wanted spiritual gifts to use for his own good? Simon, Simon the sorcerer, right? He wanted these spiritual gifts to use for his own good. He, wanted to be a, he was used to being considered something, and he didn't want to lose that. And so he wanted those spiritual gifts so he could use them for himself. That was never the intent of spiritual gifts. And you can actually say the intent of spiritual gifts weren't really even to heal people necessarily, right? He didn't heal everybody. It was more of a sign that God had the power to do that. And, and one of the great examples of that in, in my mind is the, the example where Jesus heals the man who was paralyzed, who was let down through the roof, right? The guy's let down through the roof. The, the room is crowded, and he says, your sins are forgiven. And you can just see the gasp in the audience, right? And, and I, was, I visualized that scene where Jesus is reading their thought bubbles. Who is this guy think he is? Only God can forgive sins. And so Jesus looks around. He says he knew what they were thinking, not what they were saying. And he says, which is easier for me to say your sins are forgiven or rise, take up your bed and walk? And when I, I, I visualize that in my mind, I'm thinking there's got to be a pause there. And if I'm in the audience, if I'm a Pharisee, I'm thinking, he's not going to tell that guy to take up his bed and walk. Who does he think he is? He's going to give this guy false hope. He's going to make himself look like a fool. And then when Jesus says, so that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, I say to you, rise, take up your bed and walk. And he actually did. And it said all in the house marveled. They were amazed and they were looking. I've never seen anything like this before. Have you ever seen anything like this before? No, I've never seen anything like this before. And that was their talk and their conversation. So these spiritual gifts were given to glorify God, to honor God, to make sure that people knew that they were speaking on God's behalf and that God was with them. And they had lost that focus. And if we lose our 
focus on what the purpose of things are, then before you know it, we drift so far away. You know, and that's what they had done. And, and there's so many examples just from a, a secular standpoint of that. If, you know, what's the, what is the purpose of a school? You know, it used to be reading, writing, and arithmetic, right? Teaching, teaching kids basic skills, educating them. But when the school loses that focus and they start doing all this other stuff, and you start wondering, where's the, where's the teaching going on anymore? You know, you start wondering what's going on. A business. Why does a business exist? There's really one reason why a business exists. To make money, right? And when you start thinking your purpose is something different than making money, you might find yourself in real trouble behind the times, and you're, you know, you're, you're let things slip by. And so in the, if, if the, in the church, if we forget what our purpose is, and we forget what our assembling together is supposed to accomplish... We might be doing a lot of things that aren't accomplishing that purpose anymore, and we just need to look around and say, is this accomplishing what we want it to accomplish? Is this doing what it's supposed to do? And then we'd have to make a decision to either stop that or continue it based upon, is it accomplishing the purpose that God set forth for it to accomplish? And, and I'm encouraged from what I've heard from you guys about the, the attitude of the congregation here in doing things for a purpose, doing things for a reason. And not just because maybe, maybe we've always done those things in that particular way. You have to, does this still accomplish the purpose? If it does, fine. If not, then let's try something else. And I'm encouraged that you guys do that. Chapter 14 and verse 2. He who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For you prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. So they were emphasizing tongues, and he says, the tongues that you're speaking are unintelligible to the rest of the group. Regardless of the view of what these tongues were, it's obvious from the text that no one else understood what was being said. And all you're doing is trying to exalt yourself in the speaking of tongues. That doesn't accomplish the purpose. You might feel good about what you're doing, but it doesn't help everybody around you. But if you're prophesying, if you're teaching, you're telling God's message to people, people can understand those words and then they are edified by the words that you are speaking. Now, exactly what this is, maybe it was of foreign languages that nobody there spoke. I, I tend to think that's what it was. And you think, what would be the purpose of that? What would be the purpose of me coming up here speaking in a language that none of you understood? What would, what would be your first reaction if I got up here and started speaking in another language? And I, for, for five minutes, I sat up here and I was speaking in another language. Yeah, could you explain that, please? What is this guy doing? I mean, this guy's crazy. He's up here speaking in another language. We don't understand that language. That's not helping us at all. We don't get it. And that's what they were, they were doing. They were real languages. I think Brian made the point that uh, even uh, all the tongue speaking in the Bible that we have is real languages that people could understand. And even when angels came down to this earth and they wanted to communicate, what did they speak in? They speak in languages that people could understand because that was the, the whole point of that. And I like that it says he speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to the whole church. Uh, we come together for lots of reasons. And, and sometimes people might say, I don't get anything out of the service. And a reaction that we have sometimes in that is that is you getting anything out of the service isn't important. We're here to worship God. And I think that we are here to worship God, right? And we're here to remember Jesus. But God isn't a God like, I'm going to have this assembly together where I'm, they're going to come worship me, but they're not going to get anything out of it. It's not about them. I, I think it is about us getting something out of being here, right? And this is what 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is saying. It's, it's okay for us to want to benefit from being together. That was God's plan for that to be a benefit for us coming together and doing what uh, God has told us to be together. So if you are going to speak in a foreign language in an assembly, couple rules on that. First, 
it would be better if people understood what you're saying, if they spoke that language. Second, if nobody speaks that language, what must you have present? Who, must, who else must be present? Somebody's got to be able to interpret or translate, right? Translate what you're saying into a language that we can all understand. And if that doesn't take place, then he's going to say a little bit later, just be quiet. All right, what kind of comments or suggestions or in input do you guys have at this point? Herb? Uh, we actually had that. Uh, we had a speaker from, I think it was Columbia, and he was a preacher, and he, his English wasn't as good as he wanted to be, so I think it was his son, I'm not sure, that translated. And it was a perfect example of first example. Yeah, and that edifies the church, right? If he, if he spoke in another language and didn't have the translator, that would not be good. I, I spent three months in Bulgaria after my time at Florida College, and we had to have translators everywhere we went because people didn't all speak English. And so we had students who spoke English and Bulgarian, and we would speak, and they would translate, and everybody knew what we were saying, and that's the, the, that was the plan. That was the purpose of the, of the language, of the communicating with people. Anybody else? Brian? Yeah, I mean, it's much more common for us to know multiple languages today. We've got Rosetta Stone, we have a lot of tools, you know, but back then in the first century, I mean, you just, you were not going to be well-versed in multiple uh, languages, so later he calls it like a sign to unbelievers, so how neat would it be like, if a visitor came into Corinth from some foreign land, and then God used one of the members there to speak their own language, that would have been really awesome. Yeah, yeah, and these spiritual gifts, we spend a lot of time sometimes talking about uh, the important conversation that these spiritual gifts aren't present today. That's an important thing. But maybe we fail to realize how helpful they were back then and how needed they were back then for people to even understand the gospel. I mean, Acts chapter 2 is the, a very important example of that. They were all there from different places and they all spoke different languages, and yet God used the ability to give people the, the ability to speak languages they had never studied before to teach his message to people about Jesus. And that was what it was, it was all about. Anything else? All right, let's pick up in verse 6. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, or prophesy, prophesying, or by teaching? Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? And if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So likewise you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. So what Paul does in this section, he uses two examples. I'm going to show you what I mean by this and the speaking in tongues. The first example is sort of an example that I use. What would happen if I came in here speaking languages that you didn't know? So Paul says, what would happen if I came to you and I was speaking to you languages that you didn't know? It wouldn't be a prophet to you at all. And the second example he uses is that of musical instruments. Now, I know we have people, a part of this group, that really, really know music really well and love to play instruments. And Tim is a, is a trumpet player. I don't know where Tim is right now. But Tim is a trumpet player. I know he's an incredible trumpet player. He's in the overflow room. So I thought about asking him to play some, uh, some calls for the military. Because I, I looked this up. I, I don't have military experience. So I, I looked up some of these calls. And we know one of, the, one of the military calls they play in sports venues. And that is after they play it, everybody in the crowd yells out, charge, right? Because you know exactly what that call is. That trumpet is making a distinct noise. So you know when it makes that noise, those notes are played, you know what to do. And there's, there's a retreat sound. You know, when, the, when the, the playing the retreat noise, you know what to do. You're getting out of there. And there's, there's mail room call, <laughs> you know, you wanna, the mail is here. There's things that you play for that. And a call to the mess hall. There's all kinds of different Things that are played so that people know what to do. And that's what Paul's saying. Even these instruments that aren't alive are used for a purpose. And if they played notes that no one recognized, then they would look around. They're in the middle of battle, and they need to be retreating. 
and all of a sudden the sound that comes out is something that they don't know what to do. They don't know, do I, do I charge? Do I retreat? What do I do? I don't know. I'm not familiar with that. And he likens, that's what these spiritual tongues are. What you're doing in the assembly is just like that. And that's the confusion that you're causing in the assembly. And it's not accomplishing what you want to accomplish, which is the edification of the church. It's just leading to confusion. So he's going to tell them you need to, to stop that kind of stuff as it goes. Unless people understand what you're saying, it's useless. So I, I, I do want to spend some time here for a few moments on some practical issues. Okay, because what's, what's he saying in chapter 14? One of the reasons we come together is to do what? To edify one another. That's an important part of this. So I want to ask the question to you, what kind of things edify and build you up? And then what kind of things can people do to help you? And then we'll sort of think about what we can do. I didn't, I didn't put the thing on the outline for the service and thought questions. So these are sort of our thought questions, no house to house I'm not sticking around long enough for that. I don't think you're doing that right now anyway. So let's talk about that for a little while. What kind of things are important for us to be doing in the assembly? What kind of things can build up a church? And I'll start with you. What builds you up? Presence. Mm -hmm. I just love getting together with brethren. And just the simple... Uh, you know, like the potluck yesterday, the porch meetings yesterday, house to house, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the more we get to know each other and uh, learn about one another's struggles and uh, learn about one another's lives and so forth, uh, that just really encourages me. Okay. So getting to know people better, getting to know Christians better. And I think that was one of the purposes of the house to house thing that they were doing. And the whole thing about the, what we do here t together, as far as worshiping God and studying the Bible and loving one another and reaching the lost and growing, all of that is done. I think it's a great example of taking what verse Corinthians 14 is talking about. How can we edify the saints? What can we do that edifies and builds up the church? And those things might be something that we've never experienced before, never done before. But if those things build up the church, well, let's, let's think about those things. Yes, ma'am. Just call, text, okay. text. Yeah. Just knowing people care. Knowing people care. That goes back to this love, love right? And love builds up. So people call you, text you. How's your day going? How did the surgery go? Whatever the case may be. Knowing that you're loved, right? Doesn't that build you up? And, and that's what this text is saying. So anything we can do to, for someone that communicates love is really a fulfillment of what he's trying to get to in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. You just spend time edifying one another. Pursue love. Edify one another. Do the things that build people up and not tears them down. Yes, sir. Uh, I, would, I would even go out on them and say uh, accountability. Okay. And being able to uh, encourage our brothers and sisters and brothers to grow on but also on practical level, continue to maintain their physical health and, and the value that that plays in the overall edifying of the, uh, of the church as well. Okay, so some kind of accountability, uh, spiritually, physically. To, I know someone's caring enough to hold me accountable to doing what I need to be doing for my own good and for the good of the body and for good of other people. Yes, sir. Just awareness of the world and not to mention being able to like evangelize when you're able to combine both knowledge and morals in this one, when you try to help hold them accountable, as you say. Okay. Whatever way that means. All right, so holding other people accountable, showing them love, showing them uh, what it takes to be right with God and evangelism, those are all things that build us up. Uh, yeah, I think preparation to whether you're leading singing or uh, you know, giving an announcement or a prayer or call to worship or the sermon, it's... it's you're just unprepared, and you just kind of throw something together at the last minute. It doesn't really make sense, you know, because it just grumbles. That's not very edifying. That's not very helpful. But when a person is very purposeful about, I'm choosing these songs because of this reason it matches this topic, or there's a flow to it, or to convey a certain message. That, that's always really helpful. Yeah. And that's going to be what he's, he's talking about, that everything be done decently in order. And that, that's part of that, knowing what you're doing ahead of time, being prepared for that. What else? We'll take a couple more. Yes, sir. What, what I thought of kind of trying to apply this to today, we don't have, as we talked about, like the language thing isn't maybe so much of an issue. At least here locally, you know, we all speak English. We don't have maybe the travelers like in Corinth where they speak different places. I was thinking how this would apply in two kind of opposite extremes is 
you could speak over people's heads, so not being practical, maybe showing off your fancy, you know, knowledge going into Greek. And sometimes it can be helpful, but you know, just speaking way over people's heads, it's intellectual sermon or lesson that's or even a per- per- personal Bible study, and wow, you know all this stuff that I have no idea what you're talking about. Or the opposite, which we see in a lot of the world is is a, a lesson that has no depth. It's all shallow and feels good and yeah, 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 but you walk away and you go, wait a minute, I didn't really learn anything, I wasn't challenged, there's no meat there. So I think having, whether it's personal or in the auditorium, something that really meets people where they are and, and their needs, yeah. as opposed to the two other extremes. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I think it was brought up in, in one of our porch meetings yesterday that the, the depth of the teaching here is something that somebody enjoys. You, there's always some kind of meaty things to get out of the, the teaching that is, that is done here. And so it was one of the things that was really enjoyed. All right, we got two on the same row back there. Well, ladies first. Okay, um, I was going to say, because I'm sort of fairly new here, what kept bringing me back was that people reached out to me, even away from the church. You know, like I had some of the deacons' wives took me out to lunch. The elders took me out to lunch. You know, and, and just um, reaching out to me so that I felt that love, so that I was, I was, I was edified, I was exhorted, I was in comfort. I did it, it, it everything. And that, that, that was a, a lot of the communication that was at the porches yesterday where you know, I'd ask, why do you guys like, like coming here? Why do you choose to go there? And it was like, that just felt like a part of the family almost immediately. Everybody was reaching out to me and, and coming in contact with me. And it was just important to me. Yes, sir. You know, one of the things I think that's in the Lord's church today and probably always has been is uh, sin that a, a member might be experiencing in their own life. And they feel like they can't share that because it might bring reproach on their brethren or the church. Uh, I should be better than that, and I'm just going to battle it out on my own. Mm-hmm. And one of the greatest things that's identified me is having a brother share with me a struggle he's going through. And then, hey, man, I've been through that same thing. And it's so encouraging. It, it really is identifying. To, to be able to share our weaknesses with each other, uh, Scripture commands it. Um, but a lot of times I think we get where we, we don't want to do that. And um, it's just a source of strength that we can share each other's weaknesses and uh, and not, not be afraid that we're going to lose something in the process. A, a non-judgmental attitude among a church is very help, helpful. If, if you're so afraid that people are going to judge you and people are going to look down on you forever because you've done something, you've sinned, then you're not going to get the help that you need from people. You're not going to get the encouragement you need from people. And we're going to try to battle these things on our own. That's a huge problem. I mean, that, that is a big problem, uh, especially there's so many things our, our young people face that if we're so dogmatic about certain things, they're never going to come talk to us and share their problems with us and their struggles with us. And therefore, they bear those alone so they can't bear them anymore. And then they just leave all together. They don't, they're just too afraid. So there's a lot of there's a balancing that you have to have there. I always, with, my, with, 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 the, with the kids, uh, you want to you let them know that sexual immorality is sinful, wrong. You don't participate in those things. If a, if a child sins and becomes with a, with pregnant, you wouldn't want the attitude to be, I got to go get rid of this baby because I can't go tell my mom and dad I've sinned like this, right? That, so you got that balance. You got to be able to balance this. This is truth. This is what God expects from you in the way that you live. Mom and dad love you, and you can come and talk to us about anything. And that's sort of the attitude that we have to have as a, as, as a group of God's people, that we're not going to be shunned or sent out the door in, in humiliation, that people are going to be there to listen and help us. One more. You had... no, um, I was just going to say, uh, <laughs> weekly, uh, weekly classes, um, aside from the typical services or whatever, um, I think my spiritual growth was at a congregation where this was done every week, but it was done at a different level every week. So they had classes for beginners and people that understood a lot more in depth. 
And so that covered a lot more, a lot more. And you were able to ask questions you didn't necessarily have an answer in your own head or weren't seeing an answer. So that's, that's beneficial. Yeah. So classes that are at different different depth levels. That's one thing about preaching. I've always told people it's it, the cha one of the challenges of preaching is there's really no other place where it's duplicated where you have people who are third, fourth, fifth grade and people who might have a PhD in, in the same audience that you're you're trying to connect with all of them at, at some level where they're all getting some kind of benefit out of it. That's one of the one of the challenges of it. And I did have on my list even even preachers can be guilty of violating this passage by preaching lessons that no one understands, right? Whether it's languages that uh, it, your vocabulary is too high or just this spiritual, intellectual, you've read four books on a very complicated topic and now you're trying to communicate it and the con congregation is like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And that's not edifying. And so we want to be make sure that when we come to assembly, one of our goals, obviously we're worshiping God, we're remembering Jesus, but we want to make sure that the saints that we're associated with are edified, not only in the assembly, but a lot of you have pointed out, outside the assembly, that edification still takes place. So the challenge for everybody uh, today is to think about that for a while. What can I do this week to build somebody else up, to edify someone? And whether it's the card or the text or taking somebody out to lunch and just getting to know somebody, what can we do to do that? All right, so let's go ahead and move on. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 13. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For I pray in a tongue, my spirit uh, does, prays, my, don't I have understanding? The church is not edified, we already did that. So let's go ahead and go to verse 20. Brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. So the, there's three different words here used. This children is sort of like a grade school age. Don't be children. Don't be still in school. Don't be in elementary school when it comes to your understanding. However, when it comes to malice, be infants. Be like little babies who have no malice at all. But in understanding, be like mature, grown men. And, and what were they doing in Corinth? They were acting like children, weren't they? trying to get all this praise and glory, and they, were, they weren't even doing what they needed to do, and they weren't definitely being malice, or be, and babes, you know, being babes in malice and all these sinful activities. Let's look at verse 22. Therefore, tongues are a sign not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues... And there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers. Will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if we all prophesy and an unbeliever, an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all, and thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among them. Now, Acts 2 is a great example to show that, um, that tongues is for unbelievers, right? Because they were speaking in a language so that people could understand the message and, and become believers. And he makes the point, if somebody were to come in and if we were all speaking different languages, you, you, the Tower of Babel, right? I mean, how confusing would that have been? And if, if somebody comes in here and sees not order, they see confusion happening, then that is going to be a problem. They're not going to come and say, you know what? I want to go back and be with those people again. God's truly there. And what a incredible testimony if people who came into the assembly could see by the way that we remember the Lord, Lord during the supper and see by the way we conduct our Bible classes and how important God's word is to us and see by the way that we praise him and worship him in, in, in song and our prayers. If they could say, I don't know a lot about a lot right now about the Bible or whatever the case may be, but I just felt that God was with those people. There was something about the way that they conducted themselves. God was there. And that would be a huge, huge thing for people to, to take away from a service of God's people. And I think that's, that's doable. I think that's probably where a lot of you came when you came, started coming here. You said, I, I, God's there. I can, I can see God acting and working in that, at that particular church. Any comments or thoughts up through verse 25? Yes, ma'am. Not necessarily on this topic, but just in what you were asking before about what edifies you. 
Um, I'm not a member here. I've visited a few times, but I have gone when they did their practice of their new song. And I always think that's edifying for a church when you're learning new songs and then you get to services and everybody's learning the song. It's just like going to the Florida College evening thing. The first time I went, I was like, this must be what heaven's like. Everybody's singing this beautiful song, praising God, worshiping God, and knowing the song. Yeah. I, I think that's wonderful. Okay, and just sort of what Brian was saying about preparing for worship and, and knowing the song ahead of time and being able to sing this new song in the words. And I, 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 I think it's important uh, maybe I, I shouldn't go this route, but I think it's important that, you know, if, we, if we're going to learn a new song uh, and just sing it, I, I, to, for us to know the words first. So I, I, don't, I don't really get edified when, when somebody says, we're going to sing this new song, just look at the words and start singing. I'm like, well, I don't even know if I agree with these words yet. You know, you want me to start singing a song, at least give me a few minutes to prepare and think about these words and make sure that I agree with these words before I, I start singing. You know, if, if, if Brian came up to me and said, hey, here, Preach this lesson. I said, I don't think so, Brian. I got to make sure that this is, you know, this is what God wants me to say. I'm not just going to read something that you tell me to read. So that's just a side that talks about what you were saying. Knowing the words, knowing what these words mean, knowing what the notes are. So when we come to worship, we can do these things. All right. I'm just going to, I guess we're out of time. We can't deal with 1 Corinthians 14, 34 with women keeping silent in church. So we'll believe <laughs> Brian will have to do with that later. That was what they brought you. You're, you, you do 1 Corinthians 14, and spiritual gifts, and women keeping silent in churches. So let's read verses 34 and 35. It says, Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. If they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. A lot of views on this passage, whether it's uh, views that it was wrong for a woman to speak at all in any type of a gathering and assembly all the way through. We know what's taking place in, in so-called churches today where, you know, you have women preachers and women leading singing and all that good stuff. Uh, let's look at a couple things. First of all, in verse 27, if somebody can speak in a tongue and there is no interpreter, what are they supposed to do? Keep silent, right? Be quiet. And so if uh, in verse 30, it says, but if anyone is revealed to another, so if, if I am speaking, in a, if I'm prophesying, and then you get a message from the Lord, back when spiritual gifts were, were alive and active, and you had something you wanted to say, the Lord was telling you to say, what was I supposed to do? Keep silent, right? Uh, that all may learn and be encouraged. So you come down to the same concept. So some people take the position, it's just talking about uh, the uh, questioning men. Because if the, the prophets were to question one another, right? If, you know, make sure that they, they, were, they were talking in order. They were, they were really having a message from God. That was one of the gifts is to find out if somebody was really having a message with God. So some people take that view that it's just local to Corinth, and it was local to their misapplying uh, using the women, and just like the, the guy who had a spiritual gift, he was to be quiet. If somebody else would have spoke, he didn't have an interpretation, he was to be quiet. Uh, but I, there's got to be more to it than that, because he talks about the law also says, right? So it's, it's more than just applicable to the church at Corinth. The principles here have to be applicable to more than that. So let's read a few verses that sort of deal with some of this. Look, in Genesis chapter 3, well, we don't have time to read all these verses. So in Genesis chapter 3, the, the curse on woman was, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception and pain. You shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband. And he shall rule over you. The Ephesians 5, 22 and 24 passages that we're all familiar with. Wives, be submissive to your husbands. The 1 Corinthians 11 passage that Brian talked about a couple weeks ago. There's an order of things right? There, God put this in. It's not that anybody's less important or less valuable. God cares for anyone less or anything like that. It's just, just like God, the guy who prophesied wasn't, you know, more valuable to God than the guy who spoke in tongues with an interpreter or healed or whatever the case may be. God, the Spirit gave him all the gifts. Uh, and so, and then the, the first Timothy chapter two passage is the one that is most related to this. 
And it talked about let a learn, one learn in silence while submission. I did not prevent, prevent a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, uh, but to be in silence. I think the key to this in context is orderly fashion and the, the scriptures about taking authority over, over a man. In Bible class, uh, could a woman mis, uh, act in a way in a Bible class that would be inappropriate, would be something that would uh, not be according to what God would want? Yes, absolutely, right? Uh, but, you've probably all seen it, right? Is, that, was, uh, that was in my first work that somebody warned me, you know, right away, there's this one lady, and she's going to take over your class if you let her. And so that would be inappropriate. But as far as making comments in Bible class, I think that's appropriate. I think that's the tradition of this, this congregation. Uh, but as far as preaching, leading singing, leading prayers in public assembly, that would probably be a violation of not only this passage, a lot of other passages in the Bible about how things take place. Any questions about that, you can talk to Brian and Adam about that. <laughs> Thank you for your attention.